How are we doing? We doing good? Hey, um, just by a show of hands, how many of you are already immediately disappointed I'm not the country music singer, Josh Turner? <laughs> it's cool, guys. I understand. Uh, I live in Atlanta, so when I show up for reservations to places to eat, I'm a constant letdown. Um, my family has not sat by the bathroom at a restaurant in three years because I'm like, Josh Turner, they're like, right this way into the toilets, Mr. Turner. And so, um, hey, it is an honor to be here with you guys. I was with you guys back in January. And as always, I just want to tell Pastor Greg, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, what you guys are doing here at The Crossing, um, you have some of my friends on staff. I love your pastor. And so can you just honor him? and the team here at The Crossing. Uh, it is an honor. Um, last time I came, I actually had a picture of my family that I showed you guys. I brought two of my family members with me, but they have backslidden and are at the beach right now. Um, so if you could just keep my wife and my daughter uh, in your hearts um, because they need Jesus apparently. Um, can't save them all, guys, you know what I mean? Uh, but no, it's an honor. Uh, my family's here. Like I said, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, this year I celebrate 20 years of marriage uh, to my wife. She, uh, her name is Becca, and yes, she is very lucky. Um, she hit the jackpot. So um, that is not true at all. Uh, <laughs> I pay for a lot of therapy for her um, because she's married to me. Um, but it is an honor to be here, man. It is Palm Sunday, you know what I'm saying? So this is the beginning of what we celebrate, guys. This is where it all starts. And, you know, on Palm Sunday, usually today at churches all over America and all over the world, um, there are messages being preached about Jesus' triumphant entry. Right, we know this, that Jesus is riding into the city, people are waving palm branches at him, they're screaming Hosanna, they're throwing down their coats, Jesus is riding in on a donkey, this amazing moment. There's gonna be a ton of amazing sermons that are preached on that this morning. Um, I want to preach on something a little bit different. Now, when I say that it's different, it's gonna be different. And the reason that I wanna preach on this is because I believe honestly, and this is a very personal message which you'll hear, but I believe, honestly, it's one of the most important topics as Christians and as followers of Jesus Christ that we need to talk about. And it's not an easy topic, right? Like, one of the things as a, as a pastor that gets to travel and preach, so I'm like, I, I know this topic isn't easy. And what I'd always love to do is come in and be the cheerleader. You know what I'm saying? It's like, God loves you. And then we leave and we're all like, yeah, let's go. And we all feel good about life. But sometimes there's topics that we have to talk about that are scriptural, that are hard. And I don't ever want to be the pastor, and this is just my fear. I'm just, gonna, I'm just this is being, me being really honest. That I would stand before Jesus at the end of my life and he would say, hey, you did a really good job building your kingdom. And so I know that there are stories and there are experiences in life that God has given me um, that I feel like it is part of my calling to share and help people walk through. So what I wanna talk about this morning is what do you do on the worst day of your life? What do you do when God doesn't do what you think he should? What do you do on the hardest day of your life? Like we talk about today's Palm Sunday. And I'm, I can imagine the disciples in this moment, they are pumped. Do you know what I'm saying? Jesus is riding in. They think that they've got the king that they've all been dreaming of. But how many of you know Friday and the crucifixion is coming? And so what did they do on that? We know what they did because the Bible records, but how many of you know for all of them that was probably the worst day of their life? And all of us in here, we are going to have the worst day of our life. And if you don't like the word worst, you can say hardest, you can say whatever. But what do you do with this? And the reason I feel like this is such an important topic is because guys, I have seen this absolutely push people further away from God. I have seen people, and you've seen people too, that God didn't do what they thought God should do, and they had the worst day or the hardest day of their life, and what they said was, if this is how God is, then I'm out. But I've also seen it push people into a deeper relationship with the Lord. So how do we handle it? What do you do? And, and I know that this is uncomfortable, because what, here's what we all want, right? Right? What we all want is to construct this box in our minds that God fits in. And as long as God fits in this box and God does what I think God should do, then everything in my life is gonna be okay. 
The problem is, is that God is God and God can do whatever he won't. So what do we do when God gets outside of the way that we feel like he should operate in our lives? You ever feel like your life would be a lot better if God would just consult you about things? You know what I mean? God, if you would just ask me, I know how I could best serve you. It would be winning the lottery, Lord. It wouldn't change me. It would change others, Lord, but not me. We all have this. So what do you do on the worst day of your life? Well, what we're gonna do this morning is we're actually gonna look at the book of Job. So if you have, your, someone who's like, oh Lord, um, buckle up. Um, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Job chapter one, verses 13 through 19. Now, what we're about to read, I can only describe as the worst day that I've ever heard of in my entire life. So even as we read this, I want you to understand that the majority of us that will experience suffering, pain, and trials on this level, hopefully is zero of us. But who knows? Because we live in, in, a, we live in a fallen and a sinful and a broken world and bad things happen to good people. And bad things happen to good Christians. So we're gonna pick it up, it says this. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabian raided us. They stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all your shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. What do you do with this? What do you do in this moment? Now, hopefully, like I said, none of us have experienced this type of moment. None of us have lost all of our income and all of our family and all of our assets in one fell, like not even a day, a moment. We haven't experienced this, but what do you do when the cancer's back? What do you do when that spouse looks at you and says, I don't wanna be in this marriage anymore? What do you do when, I mean, let's just be honest, the past three years have been a dumpster fire, right? And a lot of us were living in seasons of life that we thought we would never live in. And a lot of us experienced not only the worst days of our lives, but sometimes the worst moments, the worst months, the worst weeks, the worst years, whatever. So what do we do with this? Well, I believe that when you look at the book of Job, that there's actually three things that we see Job do. Now, I want to give you these things and I want to encourage you to take notes. The reason that I wanna encourage you to take notes is because if you take notes in church, you get to pick where you live in heaven. Um, <laughs> Pastor Greg hasn't shared that with you guys yet, but that's the real deep stuff. That's not true at all. <laughs> Some of you are like, dang, lakefront. Um, so I, I want you to take notes and here's why. When you go through the hardest or the worst days of your life, sometimes the pain makes it very hard to recall the things that people have spoken over you. It is a lot easier to go back and be able to reference things. And so I want you to take notes because when the time comes or when those moments come or when those thoughts come or when those situations come, it's sometimes easier to go back and say, man, what did the Holy Spirit speak over me? And, and I hope you understand this, that my prayer as a preacher, and I know for Pastor Greg as well and the entire team, that any person that ever stands on the stage and communicates is nothing but a broken man. So anything that I say today that hits you and you're like, oh, dang, that's good, that's not from me, that's the Holy Spirit speaking directly to you because the Holy Spirit knows where you're at and I have no idea. 
And so I want you to understand that when you sit in sermons and when you sit in worship and you hear things that resonate with you and where you are, it is not just a man or a woman that are saying those things. It is the spirit of God using a broken vessel to speak to his people because he knows exactly where they are. So the reason I want you to take notes is because yes, this sermon is very personal to me, but I also understand that the majority of us in here, we have been through some hard days where God has not made sense to us. We have been through those moments where we prayed the prayers and things didn't immediately get better. You ever prayed the prayer, it didn't get better, it got worse? And you're like, my bad, Jesus. Like, you just kind of like back out. So what do we do with this? So there's three things that I believe that we see uh, in the book of Job. But before we jump into these three things, let's pray. God, I thank you so much uh, for your son, Jesus. God, I thank you that this is all about him. God, thank you that in the hardship and the struggles and the confusion, God, and the worst days and the hardest days, God, that you are good and that you love us. God, these next few moments as we pull from your word, God, I pray that there would not be any distractions. God, that that you would quiet the voice of any enemy in our minds, Lord God, or in our hearts or whatever that may look like. And God, that you would do what only it is that you can do this morning and speak to your people. And God, we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, amen. The first thing that we see Job do is Job made a choice. Job made a choice. It says this in Job 1, 20 through 22. Now remember, Job has lost everything, not in a day, in a moment. Job stood up, he tore his robe in grief, then he shaved his head and fell to the ground in worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Let me tell you what I think is happening in this moment. Job stands up, tears his robe in grief and says, God gave it to me, God can take it away. Praise be the name of the Lord. That was a choice. That was not a feeling. Do you really think that Job lost all of his income, his assets, and his children, and really what he was thinking in that moment was, man, God, you're awesome. God, I love you so much. No. I can almost guarantee you because Job was human, and he had human emotions just like all of us have, but what Job did not do is he did not allow his feelings to dictate the character of God. And a lot of us on the worst days of our lives, what ends up happening is, is we don't make a conscious choice based off of the word of God and who God says he is. We ride the wave of our emotions. Listen to me, your feelings are a good indicator, they're a terrible dictator. They're a good way of kind of knowing what's going on, but your feelings do not change the character of God. And so Job in this moment where he stands up and he tears his robe and says, God gave it to me, God can take it away, praise be the name of the Lord. I don't think that was a feeling of how Job felt about the Lord in that moment. I think that that was a conscious choice that Job understood that just because his circumstances looked a certain way, it didn't change who God was. So he wasn't gonna ride the emotions of his feelings, he was gonna stand on the truth and he was gonna make a choice that even on the worst day of his life and the worst moment of his life, that God was good. So he made a choice. What choice do you make? Because guys, I'm, I can remember the worst day of my life. I know it very well. It was the day my daughter was born. And I know that's a really weird sentence, right? And you're like, you're a terrible dad. Like, I, I understand it. My daughter is the 12th known case in the world of a rare genetic disorder. Wheelchairs, tracheostomy, feeding tubes, ventilators at night, Mentally, she's all there, it's all physical. She's had over 27 surgeries. So we're going there um, to have our daughter, my wife and I. We'd had two miscarriages and then we're going to have our daughter and it was a C-section. C-sections are weird anyway, right? Because you're like just everything's so scheduled and you're like driving to the hospital and you're like, I feel like I'm coming back with a loaf of bread but you have like a kid when you come back. So we're in the operating room And I go in and my wife's there and they have the curtain up where they're doing the operation. Um, They tell you, don't look behind the curtain. Um, I couldn't help myself. Um, 
That's nightmare fuel, guys. I'm just going to tell you right now. Um, if you're in there with your wife, be supportive. Stay up by the face. Um, and so they bring my daughter out um, like Simba from The Lion King. And um, I'm standing there, and I know immediately something is wrong. And I can tell something is wrong by how quickly everybody starts moving. And so I'm standing up, and I'm watching, and the doctors and the nurses all start, I mean, they're, they're moving. My wife's looking at my face. I'm watching what's going on. And as a parent, you understand if you've ever been in the room when your children are born, that all you want to hear is that first cry. And we never heard it. And they take her over to this table, they put her on this table, and they take a, what's called an Ambu bag, and they start forcing air into her lungs. And they take her out of the room, and when I see when they take her out of the room, her body is completely limp. So a few minutes goes by, and you ever been in those moments where it's like so intense that you're like, I'm going to throw up. So the uh, nurse comes back and gets me. She goes, Mr. Turner, I need you to come with me for a second. And she takes me into a broom closet. I remember very clearly that it was a broom closet because I remember thinking to myself, y'all should have better rooms to give people this sort of news. She's like, there's something wrong with your daughter. I'm like, hold on, this mop's about to fall over. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just the most weird thing. They said, "Um, we don't know what's wrong with your daughter. Um, We have called another ambulance. We are transporting her to another hospital that has a newborn intensive care unit. And I have to be real honest with you. We don't think that she's going to make the ambulance ride. So I said, can I see her? And they said, yeah, but you cannot touch her. And I said, that's fine. I walk around the corner. My daughter's laying under a light. She has IVs in her head, both her feet, both her hands, and she's hooked up like she's on an umbilical cord. And I just, I know y'all are a Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-filled church. I can't say this in every church. And I said, well, y'all, I'm about to go ham in tongues and freak everybody out right now. So all those nurses were like, it was like a Comanche warrior in there. You know what I mean? I got after it. And so I had to go back and tell my wife. And then I had to go tell all of our family and friends. And I can remember walking back to my wife in recovery after they removed her from the operation and took her back to recovery. And I'm walking down the hospital um, hallway and the nurse's station is on my right. This is how clear this still is to me this day and this was 15 years ago. And you know when people say they hear the Holy Spirit or they hear God? I don't mean I heard an audible voice. But usually if I have a thought come into my mind absolutely out of nowhere, I kind of know that's the Holy Spirit now. And I've walked with the Lord long enough to know how he speaks to me. And I'm walking down the hallway. And it was just like I heard this voice say, how do you respond? What do you do now? And can I be honest? My feelings were not, God, you're so good. I've just been told my daughter may not make a 20 minute drive. They weren't, Lord, I just worship you in this moment. If I'm honest, there's probably a lot of cuss words and tears. But I realized in that moment I had a choice. And I had a choice of the way that I responded. Can I just say this? God can handle you in your weakest moments. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think that, like, in the moments, there's a band that I love called the Avett Brothers. Their grandfather was a pastor, and they took a bunch of his sermons and, or his, uh, yeah, sermons and turned them into songs. And there's this one phrase in one of their songs, and sometimes it bothers people when I say this, but I think you'll get it. They say, sometimes I use cuss words when I pray. Like, I've been in those moments. And I don't think God's like, well, I never. Do you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) Jesus, we're out. Like, I don't. I mean, I just think he's bigger than that. And if he understands our weaknesses and he's a loving father, then he's not going to recoil at that. He's actually going to press into us in that moment. And so I'm walking down the hallway. I may never be invited back here to preach again, by the way, after that. Um, So I'm walking down the hallway and I kind of hear God say, what do you choose? And I said out loud, and it was a choice, guys. It was not a feeling. My feelings were telling me fear, anxiety, to run. All of that, and I said out loud, I said, God, whether she lives or dies, I'm with you. It was a choice. They eventually told us Riley would live to be a year old, and my wife and I would have to determine when to let her go. In February, she turned 15. So so I say all that, 
What do you choose? What is your choice? Guys, all of us are going to have this day. They're all going to look different for all of us. But what do you choose? Do you choose that God is good regardless of your circumstances? Or do you ride fear and feelings and emotion and all that stuff? And listen, some days you're gonna do it better than the other. There's been a lot of times I've had to make this choice. Can I give you one more piece of advice on this? Um, As much as you can, decide what you choose right now. It's hard in the moment. And I think I was only obviously able to make that choice because of the grace of God in my life and in that moment. Also, I will say this. This is one of the things I've learned, and this isn't my notes, just came to me. Um, Sometimes God does not give you the grace that you need until you need it. So, so many times people will say things like, well, I, I would never be able to do anything like that in my life. I always said I would never be able to do anything like this in my life. God does not give you the grace sometimes until you need the grace for that moment. So what do you choose? The first thing we see is Job made a choice. The second thing we see is that Job wrestled. Job wrestled. And I know that's a little bit of a weird point, but hear me out. It says this if you're looking at Job chapter 3, 11 through 13. This is Job speaking to God. He said, why wasn't I born dead? Why didn't I die as I came from the womb? Why was I laid on my mother's lap? Why did she nurse me at her breast? Had I died at birth, I would now be at peace. I would be asleep and at rest. And then Job 3.20, Job says this. Oh, why give light to those in misery and life to those who are bitter? Let me tell you what Job's saying. What the heck, God? God, if you knew that all of this was gonna happen, why did you even let me be born? That is what Job is asking. Job is wrestling with God in this moment and he's going, God, I thought that if I did, then you would, and if God, you even knew all this was coming, then God, why did you let me be born in the first place? Job is wrestling with God. It is a good thing to wrestle with God. You know, so many times, I I grew up in a Methodist church, like old school, and and you hear things like this. Don't ever question God. Don't ever wrestle with God. What? How would I not question God? How would I not have these moments where God, anybody ever have a moment where God doesn't make sense to you? Anybody ever have a moment where you think, God, man, you ever had this prayer? God, I'm on your team. Like, God, I'm one of your guys. Hey, man, I'm a pastor, Lord. Help a brother out. Like, we all have these moments. And and somewhere, somehow, sometimes in Christianity and theology and doctrine and the ways that we were raised, we're almost taught, don't question. To me, questioning is wrestling. It's a good thing to wrestle with the Lord. The reason it's a good thing to wrestle with the Lord is because it forces you to understand what you believe. So I also, I work out at a church in um, LA and one of the things I've learned about working in LA is to everybody in LA, I sound like Tomater from Cars when I speak. Um, So to them, I'm basically Larry the Cable Guy when I show up at church. But one of the things I've learned working in LA and working with Christians in LA is, you know, in the South, a lot of our faith at times was handed to us by our parents and our grandparents. Hey, and thank God for praying parents and grandparents, amen? Like a lot of us aren't in jail because there was a grandmama praying for us somewhere. My grandmother's prayers didn't work because I still went to jail. Um, (laughs) My mom's watching this sermon right now and she just went, God, I wish he wouldn't tell that story. That's what she did somewhere. So, So we are handed our faith. We are handed what we believe because, and thank God for that. Thank God we have parents and grandparents that handed us what we believe about things and what we believe about who God is and Jesus is. But sometimes we can believe things just because they were handed to us, not because we understand why we believe them. One of the beautiful things about suffering and trials and hardship is if you allow God he will take you to a deeper place with him that will actually help you have a better understanding of who he is and the relationship that he desires with you. Wrestle. 
wrestle with the Lord. Go to God in prayer when God doesn't do what you think he should or you're having the worst day of your life and be like, yo, God, I, and talk to him normal. Don't dress it up. God hears through more than just stained glass window. You understand what I'm saying? You can be real with him and be like, yo, I don't understand why this is happening. And God, your word says this, but my circumstance is not lining up with your word. God, I need you to help me. And God, and I tell people this all the time. I have a buddy, um, he has some strange, for a young guy, disease in his liver. And they basically told him at some point, he's in his 30s, they said at some point you're gonna need a liver transplant and because your liver, no matter what we do, is just gonna continue to do this. And he called me one day and he said, I don't know what to do with this. And I said, I'm gonna give you a, a word of advice that I hate that I have to give you. I said, you're about to know the Lord in a way that not a lot of people know him and that's beautiful and painful at the same time. Guys, suffering the worst days of our lives, and I don't say this, and I, I'm not saying this to take away the pain. I'm not saying this to minimize it. But man, they are beautiful and painful at the same time. They're beautiful because if you let the Lord and you wrestle with God, he is going to take you to a deeper relationship with him. But they're painful because they're painful. And they stink. And we don't like them. For five years, I was totally screwed up after we had our daughter. Y'all have a pastor on staff, Pastor uh, Wayne Lanier, um, that helped me through so much my theology when we had our daughter. Uh, I call Wayne, just so if y'all need a nickname for Wayne, Pastor Wayne, uh, the Mog, the man of God, so that's all we call him. Um, <laughs> helped me so much. And I was so broken, I was so screwed up because here's what was happening. My reality did not match my theology. My reality didn't match what I always saw in scripture. And I had to wrestle with it. And it was painful. But I also know the Lord in a way now that I never knew him before. And it's taken me to a deeper relationship with him that I am very thankful for. Now, would I wanna do it all over again to know the way the Lord, the way that I know him now? Absolutely not. And I say that because when I was going through pain and hurt, I would hear older pastors say, I'd go through all the pain again to know the Lord the way I know him now. And maybe they're just better men of God than I am. But I told the Lord, if my daughter can walk and talk and walk into my arms, I'll never preach another sermon ever. And I'm just being honest with you because I don't want you to hear a pastor and a man who really loves God and loves Jesus make you feel bad because you're like, God, if you would take this away from me, I'd be out. That's human. That's who we are at times. We are broken, fallen people and thank God for his grace. Thank God that he understands. And so I wanna encourage you to wrestle with God like Job did. The other thing that you see Job wrestle with is you see him wrestle with his friends. So in chapter two, three of Job's friends show up. And at first, they're awesome, right? They just do um, Romans 12, 15. We weep with those who weep and we rejoice with those who rejoice. And they're great. But then they make a shift. And for 34 chapters, they try to just diagnose Job. Well, Job, this is probably happening because you did this and God is punishing you. Well, this is probably happening, Job, because there's a sin or you've done something. And can I just be honest? When you're hurting and in pain, people trying to diagnose where your pain came from actually doesn't help heal but brings more pain. Sometimes the best thing that you can do as a follower and a representative of Jesus Christ is to sit and cry with somebody. That is it, man. You know, even when Lazarus is dead and Jesus comes to meet Mary and Martha, one of the interesting things about that is if you watch the way that Jesus responds to each of them, he responds to each of them differently as each of them need it. So Martha wants to reason with him. Well, Jesus, if you had been here, our brother wouldn't be dead. So Jesus reasons with her a moment. Mary, he just goes and cries with. 
So understand that there are moments as friends and believers that the best ministry that you can give is the ministry of presence and just being there. Don't be like one of Job's friends that for 34 chapters tries to diagnose why God is doing to Job what God is doing. And let me just also say this, uh, just to be clear. Jesus Christ already took all the punishment that we deserve for everything. So as the, even the advice in that moment that Job's friends are giving Job do, does not apply, for us any, apply to us anymore for those of us that are in Christ Jesus because Jesus was our sickness, our punishment, and our curse bearer. So now when you and I do something wrong for those of us that are in Christ and we repent and we turn to God, we are the righteousness of Christ. So God does not see you as the things that you do or do not do. God sees you as what his son Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. You are the righteousness of Christ and God is not sitting up in heaven with a fistful of lightning bolts going, do it again. Do it again. Because he did that and then he put it all on his son for us. So Jesus paid for everything, so God does not operate that way anymore for us. However, the Bible is also clear that because God is a loving God, he will correct us. Correction will draw us to repentance, but punishment is just punishment. Jesus paid for our punishment, but because God is a loving father, there are times that he will correct us, amen? So Job makes a choice. Job wrestles with God, and this is my favorite part. The third thing is, is that Job realizes. Job realizes. You know, for 38 chapters, God is silent. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't talk to Job. For 38 chapters, Job is basically going, come on, man, what the heck? And he is wrestling with God. And can I just encourage you, if you are in a hard time, please go read the book of Job. It will give you so much peace and hope on the way that God will walk through suffering with you and trials and hardship. And for 38 chapters, though, God says nothing. And then God finally responds to Job. So I'm actually gonna read to you all of Job chapter 38. And this is the first thing that God says to Job after 38 chapters. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? God is a gangster, y'all, if y'all didn't know that, (laughs) the way that he comes out of that with a whirlwind. Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying lines? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstones? As the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, who kept the sea inside its borders as it burst from the womb and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness? For I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this far and no further will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to night's wickedness? As the light approaches, the earth takes shape like clay pressed beneath a seal. It is robed in brilliant colors. The light disturbs the wicked and stops the arm that is raised in violence. Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? Do you know where the gates of death are located? Have you seen the gates of utter gloom? Do you realize the extent of the earth? Tell me about it if you know. Where does light come from and where does darkness go? Can you take each to its home? Do you know how to get there? But I love this because God's being uh, very sarcastic right here. But of course you know all this, for you were born before it was all created and you were so very experienced. (laughs) Which shows you that sarcasm is actually a spiritual gift. So um, I got a double portion of that one. Um, I love this so much. For 38 chapters, Job is wrestling with God. And then for chapter 38, and then three more chapters after it, God is basically going, who are you to kind of question me? Do you know who I am? But here's the thing, God's not like rebuking Job. 
he's showing him that the who is greater than the why. He's showing him that, Job, you've got all this going on and you have all these questions, but let me tell you that I'm so much bigger than your questions. And Job begins to realize who God is. And it's still painful. And it's still hard. But I love Job's response after God lays this type of talk out for four chapters to him. One of them, he says, Job, can you hold the Pleiades, the constellation in your hand? And he just goes on about his grandeur and how amazing he is. And Job responds with this, Job 42, verses one through three. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. And you asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. I don't say this lightly. Could it be that the worst day of your life is just too wonderful for you to know? Could it be that God wants to use a part of your story for other people that you yet don't understand? I mean, let's just think about this for a minute. We're sitting here however many thousands of years later reading the book of Job as an encouragement that God is good in our circumstances. That on the worst day of our life, that we can be real, we can be authentic, and we can be who we are in the presence of God, and we can wrestle with him, and we can ask him questions, and he doesn't draw away from us, but he actually pushes into us and draws closer to us. And not only that, but we now also have his son who paid for all of our sins, so that when we sin, we're not actually punished by God, we are actually forgiven by God because of Jesus, and we're doing this. Do you think Job understood that in that moment? You think Job was like, hey God, this is gonna be really cool because one day there's gonna be some people in Tampa talking about this. Could it be? And please hear me, I don't say this lightly. And I don't say this to minimize your hurt or your pain right now. But could it be that just God is at work doing something that may just be too wonderful for us to understand in this moment? You know, I talked about my daughter and how that day was the worst day of my life. Um, and it was. But can I tell you how many people have come to know who Jesus is because of my daughter? And because of who she is. So here I am on her on the day that she's born, going, God, this is terrible. God, this is horrendous. God, this is horrible. And I think God was in heaven going, No, 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 no. Do you understand how many people are gonna actually meet my son because of this? So I have a really good way of telling God what's good and bad, but maybe my filter is already off and what I think is bad is actually good in the kingdom. Maybe it's just too wonderful for me to know. Maybe that thing that you're going through right now is just too wonderful for you to know. And maybe God is weaving a story in you and through you that we just can't see yet. And I know that doesn't minimize the pain, and I know that does not minimize the hurt, but it can give us hope. And ultimately the hope that we have, and we all know this, is Jesus Christ. I'm able to have hope in the pain because of Jesus. I'm, have, I'm able to have hope in the hospital room because of Jesus. I'm able to have hope in the worst days, in the good days, in the bad days, in the horrible days because of Jesus. So yes, it's good and I want you to wrestle with, what choice do you make? What does it look like for you to wrestle with God and what does it look like for you to realize that God is who he is and he is bigger than anything we can imagine? But the thing that I want you to ask yourself right now is where are you with Jesus? Because if it's not with Jesus, it doesn't matter what choice you make. Jesus is who gave us access to the Father. And so I wanna give you a moment right now to respond to this. 
So I'm just gonna ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads with me. I'm actually gonna do um, two altar calls. The first is for those of you that need to commit or recommit your life to Jesus. The second one would just be for those of you that you're like, Josh, I'm in the worst days right now, man. I just need somebody to pray with me. One of the things I love about the crossing is I know at this moment when I get down to do the altar, that there's gonna be a team of people up here that are ready to pray for you and at the campuses as well. Don't sit in your seats if you're like, oh, that is me and I need to, in the moment when the band comes and leads us. So I'm gonna do this way. I'm gonna do the first one if you need prayer. If you're in here and you would say, Josh, something you said to me today, something the Holy Spirit spoke to you today, I know that I need to respond. I'm in one of the worst days, moments, months, years, whatever it is, I just need prayer. If that's you, I'm gonna count to three and I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three, raise them. Amen. You know, the Bible is very clear that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And what that means is that every person who's ever lived on this earth, we all need a savior. Jesus Christ is that savior. Because Jesus lived a perfect and a holy and a sinless life. And the Bible says that we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God who was crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected for us, that in that moment we are reconciled to God, we are brought into right standing with him. But you are also the righteousness of Christ now. And if you're in here this morning and you would say, Josh, I need to commit or recommit my life to Christ. Let me be very clear, I do not think that you can lose your salvation. I do think there are moments in our lives when we walk away from the Lord. So when I say recommit, it's you saying, God, I'm coming back to you. God never left you, but sometimes we have a tendency to walk away from the Lord. If you need to commit or recommit your life to Christ, we're gonna count to three, and I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three, raise them. Amen, amen. God, you see every hand in this room. God, we thank you that you are a good God, that you love us. And God, thank you um, that in our struggles, in our trials, in our bad days, in our good days, that you are good, God, and your character does not change. Give us the grace, give us the patience to continually trust you and walk with you and wrestle, Lord. Guys, I'm gonna say a prayer and I just want everyone to repeat after me and let's say it like we mean it. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, right now, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are the son of God, that you're crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected for me. Save me, Jesus, and be the Lord of my life. Amen.